<laughs> Good morning, everybody. Morning. 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 There it is. I know that the first thing everyone wants to hear on a Friday morning is a lecture about ethics, the responsible conduct of research. This topic can seem like a bit of a snoozer, but today we're going to try to keep it as lively as possible, and I will, I will probably be challenging a few of the people in the audience with various questions as we move along, so everyone uh, stay, stay with me. I, uh, I, I felt that it was really important that we have a talk about falsification, fabrication, and plagiarism. Together, these are the big three that, uh, that comprise responsible conduct and research. We are, we are not, however, going to limit ourselves to just that discussion because there's an awful lot more to talk about. You will note that I've made uh, falsification, fabrication, and plagiarism um, uh, appear right next to a house of cards. And I want you to think about what metaphor I might be going for with that. Why would I draw that next to a house of cards? What is the defining characteristic of the house of cards? They're not very stable. And the, uh, the, the, if even one of those cards folds out of place, the entire thing collapses to the ground. So I want you to think of each of our careers, then, as a house of cards. We have these, uh, these fundamental papers we've published that establish us, that mark us as people to be watched in our fields. And yet, if even one of those papers is found to be, uh, to, to rely upon falsification, fabrication, or plagiarism, that entire career, even if only one cheating event takes place in your career, could still have everything thrown into the hazard if one paper is found to contain such, uh, such acts. So this is a really important lecture. I want to teach you how to have a long life career, how to be able to stay in science for a good long time and have uh, the credibility at the end that it will be the envy of everybody else. Okay, so um, we're going to start with this concept of why good scientists do bad things. I'm going to come back to this point in just a minute. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about some of the research policy that's, that's gone into defining how people define what's okay and what's not. And I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to end with a few all-stars, people who have really established that they have no idea what ethics are along the way. So I hope that those will be illustrative of uh, several different mechanisms at play when responsible conduct of research comes, uh, comes into work. So why do good scientists do bad things? I think that some of us have an erroneous idea of what people who conduct uh, who, who fall, fall prey to falsification, fabrication, and plagiarism are like. We think, oh, these people are graspers. They, they, they wear uh, dark capes, uh, and they, they twirl their mustaches, and they're, they're evil, bad people, and everyone around them knows it. What I want to, to change your mind about, though, is that bad scientists were probably once good scientists. They had good ideas. They had interesting publications. They, did, they, they were careful scholars, but along the way, they found some place where they felt it was necessary to take a shortcut. So what I'm asking you to think about is that a minor failing can become a more significant failing because if you'll cheat once in, in a minor context, you might cheat again in a, in a more significant context. So keep that, keep that in your mind. I think most people in this room would agree that academic science is a bit of a stressful atmosphere. Would anyone say that they feel carefree and joyful every moment of every day? Okay, because I want you what you're having. <laughs> so, all right. Okay, Gerard. Gerard is joyful. I, <laughs> he, he loves what he does. What can we do? <laughs> all right. But I want you... <laughs> I, I, would, I would like each of you to ask yourself if any of, these, any of these situations that I've put on screen seems familiar. My supervisor wants that result today. Has anyone ever felt that pressure? I have felt that pressure. I already know the outcome that will result from this experiment. I've, I've been asked by my advisor to chuck on some other thing on top of the heap 
of other experiments I've been doing over the last three years. It's not necessary. I know how it's going to turn out. Why do I have to bother with this? My data don't match what that famous lab published. I guess I'd better correct mine. Anyone ever feel that way? Has, do your results always agree with what famous scientist X has published? No. If this paper had a big name on it, I'm sure it would get a favorable review. <coughs> mm. And finally, I need this paper now to get that grant. I'm going to ask our newest professor, have you ever felt that kind of pressure? No, never. Never? never. <laughs> 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 All the time. All the time. All of these situations can lead to a corrosion in the standards we would normally apply to our research. They have the potential to cause that corrosion. We have to be careful against it because all of us face these pressures and it's how we respond to them that will determine whether in the long run we're willing to cheat. Maybe on a CV, I really want that job, I'm going to make myself look a little better than I do. I'm going to say I actually speak French. Parlez-vous français? All right, on we go. So why do we call these the unholy trinity? Because these are the big three. These are the things that will almost assuredly uh, get you nailed sooner rather than later. But they are not the only problems that we find in our responsible conduct of research. Fabrication, making up data or results, and recording or reporting them. Well, now that's kind of, that's kind of a three-way hit, right? It could be that my advisor says, I need to go do that experiment, and I really wanted some vacation time during then, and so I say, this is what I got from the experiment, but I didn't do it. So making up the data is in its own right fabrication. Recording those results as scientifically uh, useful data is also considered part of the sin of fabrication. And reporting them. Now, reporting them does not limit itself to just publishing. You may write a grant, uh, a grant application to the NIH, and maybe the data you had didn't look quite good enough to get you that million dollar grant. So if you fudge the numbers for the grant, that too is fabrication. Next, falsification. Manipulating research materials, equipment, or processes, or changing or omitting data or results such that the research is not accurately represented in the research record. There are plenty of examples over time of people who have uh, included a gel image from some other study and then relabeled what those bands mean in order to get a good paper, in order to get a good research grant. So falsification can be a matter of mucking about in Photoshop and just drawing in a band where you know your protein should have appeared and surely would have if nature were cooperating with you. <laughs> That's falsification. Finally, plagiarism. The appropriation of another person's ideas, processes, results, or words without giving appropriate credit. However, research misconduct does not include honest error or differences of opinion. So you and your advisor disagree how a particular uh, study you've performed should be reported. But if the numbers are, are, are valid in this case, and, and the difference of opinion means that there are just two ways to see this thing, that's not going to count as plagiarism. Now we're going to talk also about the, the misappropriation of copyrighted works as we get further on. That can also count as plagiarism. So uh, I pulled all of these from, I, I, you'll, you'll note that all, almost all of these slides have some sort of citation information at the bottom. In this case, I'm drawing from ORI, uh, the Office of Research Integrity at Health and Human Services. When we talk about health and human services in biomedical research, what are we generally talking about? NIH. NIH is part of uh, health and uh, of HHS. So when we, when we talk about ORI in this case, we are also talking about the rules that NIH would apply in evaluating whether somebody has committed fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism. Okay. Now for this, I've moved to a much more local source. Did you know that we have our own research ethics policy that's been stated by the, the Stellenbosch University website? 
You can go download this thing, pages and pages of it. So who ends up being an author on work that we publish? This is probably the number one question you get from, from grad students who are writing their first paper. Who counts as an author? So sometimes the guidance you get from your university is less than clear. Sometimes, however, it's rather revealing. And I, I wanted to talk through just some of the points in section 12.3. Authorship credit should be based on, number one, substantial contributions to conception and design, or acquisition of data, or analysis and interpretation of data. Secondly, drafting the article or revising it critically for important intellectual content. Number three, and final approval of the version to be published. Authors should meet all of the above conditions. Okay, so um, let me see. Brandon, I'm going to ask you a question. You have a table of data, and you're not sure what statistical test uh, is, is appropriate, what kind of statistical modeling is appropriate for evaluating those data. You pass those data to Gerard, who kindly agrees in one of the 60 hours of, of work he puts in every week to put together an analysis and hands it back to you. So is that the end of his involvement in your publication? It is not. Because by being involved in the data analysis, he has now uh, con contributed to the first bullet point. Do you just write up your statistics and uh, statistical methods section yourself and send it off to publication without his ever seeing it again? No. You're going to send that text to him and say, does this accurately reflect what you, what you have done with my data set? And when you have the final manuscript, it goes back to him again. So all three of these things are going to come out of this. So that's a pretty broad set of tasks that are involved for any author of a paper. But does that mean just everybody who touches your data is an author? That's a little more complex. So let's start with the first one. My PI says he has to be on the paper because he got the money. Anyone ever say that? I've said that before. All right. So acquisition of funding, collection of data, or general supervision of the research group alone does not justify authorship. So maybe you uh, have a joint lab meeting with some other PI. So three PIs get together, all the students get together, you talk about ongoing research. Just because you presented at a meeting that another PI chaired does not automatically mean that that person becomes an author on the paper. All right, next. An administrative relationship to the investigation does not of itself qualify a person for co-authorship. Everyone knows Trudy? Is Trudy down here today? She's not down here, okay. So Trudy plays an awfully essential role in keeping this division rolling. But Trudy, by just being uh, admin to so many groups, does not, in her own right, become author of the paper. Administrative relationships don't necessarily mean that. And we can interpret this another way. I like Gerhard a lot, right? He's the man who inspired me to move to South Africa. But just because he's the head of the department, just because he's the head of the division, does not mean he automatically becomes an author on my paper. Okay? Finally, the submitting author should send each co-author a draft copy of the manuscript and should make a reasonable attempt to obtain consent to co-authorship, including the order of names. Okay, does this mean that I can email Gerhard on Wednesday my manuscript and then when I get no reply from him in 24 hours, send it in? No, that does not constitute a reasonable effort. Right? A reasonable effort probably requires some chasing down the hallway and begging, please, please, can you just take five? Sometimes that's called for. So making a, sometimes you're just not going to get feedback from that really difficult to reach person. But you have to make the effort to ensure that they've had a chance to look at this manuscript before it goes in. Now there's another section in here that I think is very interesting. I'm, I didn't put it on the slide. But whether or not someone got paid to produce the data does not have any determinative value in whether they're an author or not. So you can think of this in a couple ways. It could be, well, I'm writing a paper out of this particular grant. My grant didn't pay that person, therefore I don't have to include them as author. That, that, that's the wrong thinking. Also, we often use commercial services like the, what, like the central analytical, analytical facilities. 
just because you paid Mare to produce a bunch of proteomics data for you doesn't mean that he doesn't get authorship credit because he may have had a lot to do with how you designed the experiment. If so, that is authorship. He needs to see the final draft before it goes. Now, I think a lot of us have seen a lot of specious claims about something called fair use. Fair use. Often, when we work in academia, we assume that if somebody has a, a figure in a textbook, well, surely I could scan that and throw that into my paper. Probably not true. You've, if you've spent any time on YouTube, you've probably seen a number of people who uh, have ripped the entirety of Lawrence of Arabia, uh, changed its aspect ratio slightly, and then reposted it to YouTube. That, too, is not fair use. But understanding what fair use is probably requires a lawyer. So uh, I'm going to put uh, Belinda on the spot here for uh, defining fair use for all of us. She's just graduated. She's all set for this. But for now, I'm going to turn to these two questions. This came from uh, a document from the Association of Research Libraries, Code of Best Practices and Fair Use for Academic and Research Libraries. The topic is wildly complex. But most judges, when they're deciding whether the use of something is fair use or not, say, did the use transform the material taken from the copyrighted work by using it for a broadly beneficial purpose different from that of the original? Or did it just repeat the work for the same intent and value as in the original? So maybe the big name in your field has published a paper about MDSCs, let us say. So maybe they've shown how, what, what role MDSCs play uh, in the inflammatory process, blah, 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 blah. And it's a great figure, and you just want to use it. If you simply use it to introduce this topic and say it's from this paper, that's not enough. Because it's for the same intent that it was originally created. Which means that you need to get copyright permissions in order to reuse that image in your paper, even if, it's, uh, even if it was previously published somewhere else. If, you, if it was previously published in Nature Biotech, Nature Biotech, by all odds, owns the copyright to that figure. And they can prevent your paper uh, from being published if you reuse their copyrighted material without permission from them. They are the copyright holder. Okay. Was the material taken appropriate in kind and amount considering the nature of the copyrighted work and of the use. If you end up quoting 50% of a published article in your article, you're in trouble. That is not allowable. A, a small borrowing, grabbing a sentence from there, saying this, this quote pulled from this manuscript, etc., that's going to be all right, generally speaking. But if you copy a, a huge bulk of the material from another paper, you're going to be in trouble. Can I make an additional comment? Please, yes. Even if it's your own figure <coughs> and it has been published, the publisher has the copyright. So you must ask for permission to right. reproduce your own figure. Right. I, I used papers I had published as source material for my PhD dissertation. But we really needed to get copyright permissions from the journals that had published those papers to reuse the figures I had made in that. Uh, so, in this case, I, I don't think I included the quote about self-plagiarism, but let me see. All right, well, I didn't get to it, but it is possible to plagiarize yourself. You created this figure for this paper, and then you reuse it in another context. You can self-plagiarize because you not, no longer own the copyright to that figure that's been published. Yes? What about if you change the image significantly from the original? So maybe you publish... Generally speaking, that's, that's one of the, the contexts of fair use. If you have modified the figure significantly from its original source drawing to another, that's fine. I, for years, I've used a figure in uh, introducing protein identification that, bar that started from a figure that a friend of mine published, but I re-rendered everything and changed the, the orientation of things to highlight a different aspect of it. So I, I still say, um, uh, uh, borrowing from a figure created by Alexei Nesvishki, but the figure is one that I've created based on his. I think it's always appropriate to, to talk about your network. Where did this come from? Uh, and and to, to explain that this is based on a figure from somebody else is, is appropriate. Yes, sir. The standard for that is adapted from. Adapted from, yeah. And, but the, the standard has to be that there has to be substantial adaption, not adaptation, not just like if you publish it in a different language and translate the word. Oh, yeah, translating labels wouldn't be enough. That's not enough. 
It has to be that you have substantially altered the intention. Yes. So fair use is a complex topic. Um, we can all talk to our law person now, so that'll help us. Great. Now, who bears responsibility? At the end of this talk, I'm going to be going through kind of a hall of shame of, of investigators who have done some really desperately awful stuff. But the reality is that if you look at the Office of Research Integrity's findings against individuals, it's not just the big famous rich scientists who get nailed. Far more frequently, it's somebody who was a postdoc or somebody who was a PhD trainee. You can get nailed at a very early stage in your career for this. In fact, those are easier targets for them. They don't have universities who are really invested in protecting them. So, researchers, oh sorry, this is coming from the Singapore Statement on Research Integrity 2010. It's one of the documents I've, I've seen that uh, surfaced since I originally created these slides, so it's a really great document. Researchers should report to the appropriate authorities any suspected research misconduct, including fabrication, falsification, or plagiarism, and other irresponsible research practices that undermine the trustworthiness of research, such as carelessness, improperly listing authors, failing to report conflicting data. Did you see that? Failing to report conflicting data? That's considered misconduct? Or the use of misleading analytical methods? What if I am using some software, maybe it's Prism, you could do this in any number of toolkits, and uh, I try the test that I thought was the right one and I didn't get a significant p-value, so I kept shopping for different statistical tests until I found one that does give me a significant p-value. That's an example of misleading analytical methods. P-hacking, p-value hacking is what we call that, not kind. This document though is a really good one, it's actually quite short, easy to read. And I really like these principles that came out of it. We should have honesty in all aspects of our research. We should have accountability in the conduct of our research. We should have professional courtesy and fairness in working with others. And good stewardship, good stewardship in re of research on behalf of others. So there are a lot of ways that this can spill out. I'll, I'll try to talk through each of these. Honesty. If you are withholding data, that runs counter to the point you want to make in your paper, that would be an example of lack of honesty. Accountability in the conduct of research can, can be even about accounting, about the actual physical accounting of things that you bought with one grant and may use in the context of another grant. Sometimes that is enough to constitute research misconduct. Professional courtesy, if you have uh, borrowed ideas from somebody's published paper and you don't bother citing them, that's pretty rude frankly. And a, review, a proper reviewer is going to nail you to the wall for it. Good stewardship of research on behalf of others is an important one, though. If I publish a paper that says these five genes are useful biomarkers in the detection of colon cancer, and let's say Spiso becomes a, a graduate student for another lab working in this area, and she, gets, and she gets to invest the next five years in chasing down those five proteins and deciding whether they're actually viable or not, she is de her, her graduate studies are dependent upon this card that I've played in, in the press, this point that I've tried to establish. I could totally burn her time to no purpose whatsoever if I pu publish a list that I know is actually unsupportable. Stewardship, being appropriate in uh, seeing that the, the resources of the scientific community are not squandered, matters. <laughs> Now, we can really throw some tendrils very broadly, and I really love this paper from 2006 that tries to talk about all of the odd things that happen in, in research labs, but let's try to walk through this. The meaning of data is, is something that can be very badly misconstrued. Your principal investigator in your lab is probably very, very busy, and frequently he or she is not going to know everything that's going on in the lab. But at the point of publication, your PI has got to understand the points you're making and the basis upon which they're published, or you can, what can result can be an unethical publication. So bringing the PI into the loop eventually is going to have to happen. Are the results reproducible? I absolutely fetishize uh, quality control issues in biotechnology. There are a lot of things that we don't understand about how if you were to repeat the same study ten times, you get seven different results. That's problematic. So, the reproducibility of results matters. How did you clean data? 
If you found that removing this sample and that sample from a large cohort suddenly gives you a significant p-value on a protein that you really like, that is not responsible cleaning of data. All right? Trimming out outliers to, uh, until you get the significant p-value on your protein of interest is bad practice. <coughs> Lots of rules associated with how we do science. It may be that you bought a reagent with one grant that you then reappropriate from, uh, for work in another one. That can be unethical in many circumstances. Institutional review boards and other regulators make our work even harder because we've got to go through the fun of ethics applications. Well, great, but why do we do that? We do that because in the past, scientists who, who have uh, carried out studies have demonstrated that they did not take all the ethical issues into account. If, if you want to have a lot of fun, you can, you can read about some of the studies in syphilis in the uh, African-American population in the United States. There are reasons we have watchers over scientists. Materials handling policy violations. Well, yes, even that can create some unethical situations. But think about life with colleagues. What if you, as a grad student or a postdoc, are not keeping enough information in your lab notebooks to establish when you learned each fact? If something you're going after is going to have intellectual property attached to it, that's a pretty big deal. What about a, a PI, a, a principal investigator, who holds back someone's career because he or she is a useful person? Now, I, I was the system administrator for my lab when I was a PhD student, and I know I was doing useful stuff for them. I often thought to myself, am I being held back so that, uh, so that this person can milk another paper out of me? Some of that paranoia is just paranoia. But it is certainly the case that in some cases, people have gone so far as to write bad letters of recommendation to prevent people they find critical from moving on to the next stage of their careers. That too is unethical. Politics. Politics are, are with any system where you have two people or more. Pressures of production. Is it more important to get lots of papers, or is it important to get that nature paper, or that science paper? These pressures have a, have a lot to do with unethical behavior in our field. Improper review? Yes, sometimes the people who are reviewing your manuscripts for a journal are thinking, oh my gosh, if this paper sees the light of day, mine will be dead. This happens, it really does. So we have a responsibility as peer reviewers to evaluate the, that science on its own footing, not on the basis of whether it holds up our research in some way. Okay. So let us move further on. I don't want to spend a huge amount of time there. So what is the cost? If we behave unethically, let's ignore the damage that's possible for our own careers. What is it that it can cost? Well, first off, it slows scientific progress. I already talked about the example of uh, publishing a bogus list of biomarker proteins and having some poor grad student chasing those down for years to no effect whatsoever. Slowing scientific project, uh, progress is terrible undermines trust in the research process. One unethical finding uh, that gets published about, the sci uh, about science research causes the, the, the world to read in the New York Times that biomedical research is on shaky ethical grounds. That sort of thing means that funding agencies get less money, and we have more bureaucracy overlooking us, and people don't believe you even when you publish legitimate research. This is a corrosive effect. Every unethical act in, in research spills onto people all around them. If you've ever shared a paper with an investigator who, gets, uh, who comes under an ethical cloud, you yourself will have some of that, that cloud transferred onto you. That's very corrosive. It wastes public funds. They're never enough. So let's not waste it. And it increases this external regulation as a result. There's actually been a lot of research on this subject. This slide is now kind of old, but th there's always an ongoing process of new researchers coming into the field and looking at just the ethics of how research uh, and, and biomedicine gets uh, covered. Improper behavior is widespread. I'm going to show some stories of all stars, as I've said, but there are new findings all the time of a graduate student who has behaved improperly, of a PI who's behaved improperly, of technicians who made up data so that they could get an early weekend. This stuff happens. And it happens at every institution. It's not a, an Africa thing. It's not a TB thing. It's, it's, it's everywhere that this is taking place. 
The amount of double publication is on the rise, which is to say that with one set of experiments, we see multiple papers resulting. We need to be very careful that we're not double publishing these things. <coughs> Improper behavior frequently does not get reported. So this is a dangerous thing. If you as a graduate student observe some sort of unethical behavior in your laboratory, you might reasonably think, what are the outcomes if I'm wrong? Or if, if the administration finds that I'm wrong about my, this being actual bad outcome? Will there be any protection for me if I report it? So yes, there are lots of reasons why you might fail to report this sort of thing. I'm buddies with the professors in this division. It's going to be very harrowing if I say that my buddy has been engaged in some sort of unethical conduct. However, in 2010, there was this nice paper that says peer intervention is effective. Now, does that mean if I look at a table of stats from Gerard, I'm going to just use you as another example, and I say, well, this is not the right test. Does that mean I run to uh, the, the ethics office at Stellenbosch University and turn them in? No, of course not. <coughs> peer intervention does not start with the research ethics office. Usually, it would come to my saying, I was looking at this table, and I'm not sure how you get to this set of numbers. Um, is that a correct test in this context? That's intervention. That is part of the process we should all be engaged in on a regular basis. And there's also been a push that funding should be tied to our integrity. If this division suddenly gets a cloud over it that someone looks at our publications and says, these experiments never took place, our ability to get funding is going to be severely diminished. So all of these things have been uh, in motion for quite some time. Ethical research is our ability to perform ethical research is a, is a necessary condition for anyone to believe what we are claiming in our scientific papers. Failing in ethics will not just compromise the one study in which ethical uh, lapses took place. It will corrode every other bit of credibility to which that person's career is tied. So let's start with Taliarkin's sauna fusion. Got a science publication, 2002. We can make fusion happen. The, the millennium of free energy is upon us. And yet, some of the other uh, researchers out there who said, this is so amazing, we need to reproduce this experiment to show that we can, we can make the same thing happen in our labs. As it happened, collaborators at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, where I was a postdoc, uh, undertook the, to reproduce this research. Couldn't get it to happen right. Now, on the strength of this publication, Taliarkin got a job with Purdue. He was very excited about it. And yet, when they started sniffing over his research at, at the prior institution and this one, they found that his 2006 claim that another lab had reproduced his result was undermined by the fact that he had been involved in that reproduction. That become, suddenly, it's not an independent confirmation. If, if he had to be there to, to do whatever to make that result happen, it's not a reproducible concept. I really feel that this Purdue report that was published in, uh, in 2008 is kind of a masterpiece, and it has this lovely little paragraph in it that explains how a lot of this stuff spirals. From small beginnings, there developed a tangled web of wishful thinking. Who among us does not want our projects to succeed? You know, if I publish something and somebody else is failing to, to reproduce it, I, I want to help them, right? I, I believe that the result I published is legit, and my wishful thinking here can cause me to, can, could cause um, my involvement in somebody else's lab result to, to be a, a failed independent replication. Wishful thinking is something that we're all prey to. Scientific misjudgment. Well, now we're really getting into something that's quite obviously uh, lapsing into bad ethical behavior. Institutional lapses. Do you think the institution for which Taliarkin worked in 2002 wanted that paper retracted? No. Institutions like their milepost papers. They like to be able to say, we publish in science and nature routinely. So institutions can also lapse in their enforcement of these rules. And of course, human failings. 
So I, I think it's, it's clear that there are, there are failures that can happen at all these different levels that allow an, ethic, an ethically uh, questionable research result to, to fester. Now, stem cells and cloning have been a really rich area. In fact, if you uh, read paper, uh, there's a very useful blog site called Retraction Watch. Retraction Watch has been very excited in recent weeks because of papers on cardiac stem cells. Uh, it's gotten to the point where one of the, the uh, a lead researcher in the field has said, stop publishing about stem cells in the heart. They don't exist. <laughs> so it, it's been very contentious. But way back in 2004, uh, Huang Wu Suk uh, claimed to have cloned a stem cell. Very exciting. And his researchers uh, actually did have some pretty good products here. Look at 2005. Who wouldn't feel good about cloning a puppy, right? That's good news. Called Snuppy. That's an adorable dog. All right. But in that same year, he claimed to have established 11 patient specific stem cell lines using the nuclear transfer technique. However, he was caught because the data upon which those stem cell publications re relied were fabricated. So he was forced to resign, and he was imprisoned for embezzlement. Um, I, I read recently that he had just finished something like a two- or three-year trial uh, covering his embezzlement of funds, meaning he was given these funds, and that meant he had responsibility for seeing that they were spent responsibly. He failed in that capacity, therefore he's found guilty of embezzlement. All right, very famous scientists, now not a scientist. But what about authorship, right? Let's step outside the fabrication, falsification, plagiarism world. Robert Slutsky was a postdoc over at UCSD, and in the period of uh, 1983 to 1984, he averaged one new published paper every 10 days. <laughs> 10 days. That's like, what, 36 papers in a year? That's nuts. Absolutely nuts. So how did it do it? Well, first off, his, all the researchers around him were like, this man is a prodigy. He has 10 good ideas for every one of anybody else. <laughs> Often, however, this, I'm, I'm now quoting from the science article. Often, it seems, the changes were designed to make results statistically significant. Maybe p-value hacking, maybe fudging numbers to squeeze several publications out of the same batch of data, why do a new experiment when you can just republish an old one, right? Or to satisfy criticism by journal editors who were reluctant to publish the work in its original form. So send in the paper when the journal editor says, well, I, I didn't find this part very compelling, just make up some new numbers that are compelling. So Slutsky vanished, basically. His, his career is over and more than half of his papers were found to be uh, scientifically suspect by the auditors. This all started out of a process by which people were evaluating him for promotion. And in looking him over for promotion, they discovered it's a house of cards. My final example is Anil Potik. He's kind of close to my heart, right? He does gene expression work. And he was very heavily involved in uh, cancer biomarkers. Very rich field for this kind of thing. Anil Poti, however, is no longer a researcher at all. He was at Duke uh, University, an excellent school, and I'm going to start with a point that might seem trivial. He claimed in his, uh, in his grants, in the bio sketch he provided, to be a Rhodes Scholar. A Rhodes Scholar, that's very prominent, right? That must mean he's really amazing. So uh, we're, I want you to keep this, this error in his CV in, in the back of your mind. He published in the New England Journal of Medicine and in Nature Medicine. And he published amazing results. He had a perfect classifier to find, uh, let me see, this was breast cancer, I believe, to find subclasses of, of, of women who desperately needed surgery and separate those from people who had more uh, slow-growing slow tumors, for example. Perfect biomarkers. Amazing results. However, some researchers at uh, another university, Baggerly and Coombs, down here at the bottom, began trying to reproduce his finding from the data he himself had produced. And they kept finding all sorts of things that failed to line up. My favorite is an off-by-one error. So in the off-by-one error, the set of genes that he called part of his uh, decision-making panel were all off-by-one in the table. 
So he was giving the gene name after the gene he was actually claiming to be differential. Clinical trials were going on using this biomarker signature. So there were three clinical trials, and the NIH, when the NIH learned of this problem, they said, whoa, everybody stop. We are not going to continue with this study anymore. And now I would point out, there are many women who were part of those trials, who are part of a class action lawsuit to nail him to the wall. He's going to have a very unpleasant life. So Duke suspended him. They retracted many of his papers. And recently, the Office of Research Integrity found that it wasn't just about making mistakes. It was about falsifying and fabricating data. He presented lung imagery that wasn't even from that study to buttress his claim. <sighs> this person is, this person is dust. All right. So it, I, I realize these examples are a little bit bioinformatic in nature, but I think you can see how they would apply to you as well. Out of five data sets I've tried, only one of them shows your algorithm to outperform existing tools. Is it okay to publish just the good set? No. You can't publish only the data that supports your case. That's not okay. In comparing your algorithm to a published one, you tried 10 different configurations of your tool, hoping that any of them would outperform the one configuration on the published tool. Is that an okay comparison? If, if you do optimization of your configuration on your software, you need to do optimization of configuration on the other tool as well. A researcher has asked your evaluation of her data using the software tools you write. Does that mean that you now have the right to include her data set in the paper you're writing about your tools? No. People do have ownership over the data they themselves have produced. So if you're, if you're intending to include that person's data set, you must get her approval on that, on that inclusion. And as an author, she gets rights of final refusal on the manuscript you've created. If a senior researcher were listed as an author, your paper might get a more favorable review. Is it okay to slip them into the author line since they saw you give a seminar on your, on your paper? Nah. No. Nah. So gift authorships are something that senior investigators should be on the watch for. If, if you suspect that somebody is only adding your name as somebody who doesn't know the research uh, to the author line, you should be rather suspicious of their motives for that. So no matter your role in research, whether you are an intern or a postdoc, a graduate student, a, a PI, you are subject to ethical scrutiny. You yourself can bear the consequences of, of failures in this space. Acknowledge others' contributions by taking care in authorship and respecting their work. If you don't like somebody, that doesn't mean you get to throw them off the author, author list. <laughs> I'm just saying. Apply the same skepticism to your own work that you would apply to others. Remember, when you publish a paper, there are people who doubt whether it's real or not. So if you can exhibit doubt about your presentation of the work and find its weaknesses, you can make a stronger case that your research is real. Finally, this, this point of the house of cards is, is a key one. Your credibility is vital to your career. If people have to ask themselves, well, do I really believe that? Um, your career is over. You're not going to be able to, to continue in science for long. If you blow it by faking data, you will deserve what comes to you. All right, that in a nutshell is, is our talk on ethics. I hope that's useful. Any questions?